Howdy folks, this is Miss Sinclair from Miss Sinclair's history class. Today, we are going to be finishing up period two in the APUSH curriculum. If you remember, period two is the colonial era before the revolution. Last time we talked about American slavery, today we are going to be talking about colonial society. Now, this is this is the exact same lecture my students get in class with me. I am recording it to help other students, teachers, and anyone who might be interested in learning about US history. You can find these lectures on YouTube. And in that case, there is a PowerPoint that goes along with them. So you can take notes and see maps I'm referring to, or you can just listen to the lectures on YouTube or on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Um, there's a Miss Sinclair's History podcast, and that might be helpful as well. If you are a teacher and you find this helpful, consider looking at my Teachers Pay Teachers website. Um, all of the PowerPoints and lecture notes and free stuff is all on there. Hopefully it might be helpful for you. But let's finish up today by talking about colonial society. So last time we talked about the experience of slaves. I would like you to remind me of what that was like. What was the middle passage? What was the life expectancy like? What was their cultural, society, religion, et cetera? Again, use these reflection questions as a self-assessment tool. You can ask yourself, did I actually retain any of the information or did it go through my eyes and out my pencil and skip my brain altogether? If you struggle with these reflection questions, it might mean that you need to review your notes. If you can't remember what we talked about two days ago, how will you remember it in May? Okay, so we are talking about topic 2.7, colonial society and culture. Now, there are different ways to organize content to match these um, objectives and topics. I have organized it in different ways in the past. So for example, I have talked about Bacon's Rebellion under this topic instead of 2.6, or I've even talked about maroon societies and manumission in this part as well. So I would like you to be able to explain how and why the movement of a variety of people and ideas across the Atlantic contributed to the development of American culture over time. So let's talk about the public sphere, right? So the public sphere is this idea of society, right? So your home, your personal life is the private sphere. But when you go out to work, when you are at school, politics, all of that happens in the public sphere. So one of the things that is unique to the American colonies is suffrage, the right to vote. Now, if you remember in England, you had to have at least three acres of land to have the right to vote. And that meant 90% of English men could not vote. But in the colonies, since there was so much more land available, it meant that 50 to 80% of white men could vote. It depended on the individual colony. That's a huge difference, right? If 80% of the white property owning men in your colony can vote, then that is going to be a much more democratic system. Your average citizen has much more of a say in laws and policy than in England. So we see that colonial governments will form assemblies. Now, these take different names. You might uh, remember the House of Burgesses in Virginia or the General Court in Massachusetts, but in either case and across the colonies, you see a general form of government being created. Bicameral legislatures 
where representatives from the community make up the people making the laws. You also see this colonial press being very active, right? You have circulating libraries, so places where people can go and get books. Especially in New England, the literacy rate was extremely high. You had colonial newspapers and this, um, just this frank exchange of ideas. Now, many of the assemblies, uh, many government officials were not a huge fan of this. Um, the media often acts as a check on uh, government power, even in the 19th or in, even in the 18th century. And so freedom of the press is a really controversial idea. And freedom of the press in 18th century American history is very different than what we think of it uh, as today, but still there was more freedom of the press in the American colonies than most places. So let's think about uh, philosophy for just a second, or we're gonna take a little deep tour. Do you think humans are intrinsically good or evil at our core? Are humans intrinsically inherently good, right? Is everyone basically a good person that then perhaps becomes bad or are we inherently evil? Are we inherently bad and we are just raised to be good? What do you think? I don't have an answer for you, but this question, what is the nature of man is going to be one of the big questions during the enlightenment. And based off how you answer this question will impact the form of government that you set up. So what about Americans? If you think about American society, American culture. Now, I want you to think in general across time, right? I know it's been a rough couple of years, but in general, do you think Americans view people as inherently good or evil? Right? Are we an inherently optimistic or pessimistic people? Now, my answer might surprise you because this is uh, 2022 has been a year um, where you'll hear pundits and um, academics and authors and journalists talking about how Americans are extremely cynical right now. We are very nihilistic, but in general, throughout American history, we have been optimistic, right? Our laws, our systems um, tend to believe the best in people, innocent until proven guilty, right? This idea that you can improve your life. If the American dream, right? If you work hard, you can make your life better. Um, that um, our systems might be flawed, but they are designed to try and improve people's lives, to offer a fair chance to most people. We have public education. We have, um, you know, universal suffrage. Um, for the most part. Americans have always been viewed as optimists. And in fact, if you talk to people in other countries about Americans, they tend to be like, ugh, roll their eyes. Like Americans are so friendly. Like they are so optimistic. They're so nice. It's weird, right? You go to places in Europe and you walk around and are like, good morning, how are you? And people might look at you with suspicion, like, why are you being like, why are you giving me attitude? They don't, they don't think you're being sincere when you say like, good morning. Like, how are you? Um, I hope you're having a good day. That kind of greeting, which is so normal here in the United States would be viewed as um, facetious as you're being fake. So why does this matter? Well, 
because we are entering a really important time period in terms of philosophy, in terms of um, intellectual development known as the Enlightenment. Now, when it comes to the American Enlightenment, Benjamin Franklin is really like the quintessential American Enlightenment thinker. He's self-educated. He is a Renaissance man, right? He has a um, is a newspaper publisher. He's from um, Philadelphia. He has a debating club called Junto, um, in which they discuss morals, politics, natural philosophy. It will eventually become the American Philosophical Society. He forms libraries. He writes Poor Richard's Almanac. He'll become famous in Europe for his scientific um, experiments, right? He's the one who attaches a key to a kite, um, flies it during a storm, lightning strikes it. Um, he is going to stress the importance of the individual. Because that's the other thing. If we're talking about American culture, we are hyper-individualistic. Um, no other country on the planet, no other culture is as individualistic as we are. And you start to see that culture um, beginning in the uh, 18th century, right? The American mind is really the concept of being an individual. We can achieve moral perfection, right? This idea of original sin, the Calvinist idea that uh, man is inherently evil and thus um, deserving of damnation, um, we're going to um, abandon that pretty quickly, right? Franklin does. He, um, he looks at Americans and looks at how we want to be an individual, right? We don't waste things. Um, his poor Richard Almanacs um, will talk about how to sort of live well, right? Get up early. Don't drink to excess. Um, imitate Jesus and Socrates. Um, ben Franklin is a very witty guy, right? He is going to have all kinds of witticisms. Um, let's see, what are a couple of classics? Everything in moderation, including moderation. Um, um, what is it? Only two things are guaranteed in life, death and taxes. He knows how to play an audience. He's charming. Um, he is going to represent the American colonies um, as an ambassador to France. And whereas Thomas Jefferson will be like dressing like the French and speaking French fluently and like fitting in. Ben Franklin's going to live up to every American stereotype. He's going to wear a raccoon skin hat. Um, he's going to um, sort of play into their expectation of the um, unsophisticated American. Okay. The other Enlightenment thinker that is a must know, and we'll dig into Enlightenment philosophy more as it pertains to the Constitution. But the other guy who you have to know is John Locke. And this takes me back to the question of what is the natural state of man, right? If man is good, um, then you can set up a government, you can set up a system of laws that trusts that. If man is bad, then you need a system of government that restrains man. Thomas Hobbes is another Enlightenment thinker. Um, well, he's going to be a little bit before the Enlightenment. And Hobbes um, believes that the natural state of man, the state of nature, is one of violence. Man is inherently selfish, right? Given the option to just take what we want. We're just going to take it, right? Look out, look throughout America, um, not just American, but world history. Mankind's history is littered with violence and murder and greed. Um, we do things for our own pleasure. We exploit other human beings um, just so our lives can be more comfortable. Man is evil and thus needs to be restrained. Hobbes believed that you needed a absolutist monarch. You needed an autocratic ruler, um, one person in charge to restrain humanity, right? You needed strict laws and harsh punishments. 
John Locke, on the other hand, has a much more optimistic view of mankind. And we'll talk more about why that is in both these cases. But if man is good, or at the very least hopes to be perceived as good, that means our, our human nature is characterized by reason, right? We can think about it and tolerance. We want to be perceived as being good people, as being honest. So imagine everyone leaves the room and all the students are gone. And I see there's a $20 bill on the floor. It probably belonged to someone who sat in one of the desks close to there. So I pick it up. What are my options? I can pocket it, be like, all right, here's my lunch. You know, uh, Miss Sinclair is going out to dinner tonight. Or I can ask around and see who it belongs to. Now, you come back into class and say, hey, Miss Sinclair, I lost 20 bucks. Have you seen it? I could see, I could say, yeah, absolutely. Here it is. Or I can say, I'm sorry, I didn't see it, but I'll look around and see if it comes up. And then the next day in front of the entire class, I can be like, hey, kiddo, I found your $20 bill. Here you go. And suddenly, oh my gosh, Miss Sinclair is such a good person. She found the money and she didn't keep it. She could have kept it and she gave it back, right? <laughs> the end result is the same. You still got your money back. Um, but the latter option makes me look like a better person. So we want to be perceived as good at the very least, even if our motivations are uh, questionable. Um, the end result is you still got your money back. That's a good thing. And John Locke also thinks humans want a stable society. We want to be part of a group, right? Think about how we view loners. Um, it's a little bit of suspicion, right? Think about and, um, how often, if you are into true crime at all, or into any of those procedural like crime TV shows, like Criminal Minds or Law and Order, so often like the murderer was a loner. He didn't have any friends. He didn't have any connections, kept to themselves. The serial killer um, had never been in a relationship, had never um had anyone love them, like blah, 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 right? We kind of want to be part of the group. We view loners with a little bit of suspicion. So government needs to just try and organize these groups. And here's the big one. John Locke says, man has natural rights, God-given rights, fundamental rights. You are born with these rights. And these rights are life, liberty and property. And when no government has um, the right to take those from you, unless you hurt someone else's natural rights. What does that mean? Well, if I murder you, I have taken away your life that means I forfeit my own, right? The government can now punish me by executing me. Or if I steal from you, um, I have taken away your property. You have a natural right to property. I have deprived you of that. Therefore, I can be punished. It is the job of government to protect a person's natural rights. And so that we cannot violate each other's natural rights, governments draw boundary lines, right? Um, they make it illegal to steal. They make it illegal to murder. <clears throat> okay. So just hold that in your mind a little bit. Um, it's going to become more important next unit. There's a great video from the YouTube channel School of Life that really digs into John Locke. I really encourage you to watch it. All right. What's the other big event intellectually, philosophically in terms of the pre-revolutionary period? Well, the big event is known as the Great Awakening. Sometimes referred to as the First Great Awakening because we will talk about a Second Great Awakening in the 1800s. So in 1740, we start to see these religious revivals. 
The first guy you got to know in connection with the great awakening is the congregationalist minister. So a Puritan minister named Jonathan Edwards. And he is most famous for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. <clears throat> he really wants people to return to the idea of an all-powerful God, right? Um, he looks around at Americans and says, you are risking your eternal souls, right? You are not living in a way that honors God. And the consequences for that are eternal. Um, if you do not honor God, then you will be judged for your sins. And if no one tells you that what you're doing is wrong, then, you know, shame on us. It's like, if I saw you, um, violating school policy, but then I was like, "Mm, I'm just not going to say anything. And then you got in trouble with the principal. You would be kind of like, Miss Sinclair, why didn't you tell me that this was against the rules? Um, like I'm, I'm getting detention for this. I'm getting suspended for this. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. You'd be mad at me for having to be punished. Now you still broke the rules. The punishment would be just, but I should have really said something. This is Jonathan Edwards idea. You're sinning. And the, you know, since God is all powerful, he has the right to punish you, but you should know Um, that you are sinning, right? You should be able to make the informed choice. So Jonathan Edwards is from Massachusetts. He inherited his grandfather's church and um, as pastor. And he realizes that his grandfather didn't ask for any evidence of saving grace, right? Um, You just had to be on your best behavior, right? If you were basically a good person, then um, you were probably going to heaven. Well, that's not what Calvinist theology says, right? You are saved by grace, not by works. It's not about being a good person. It's about receiving God's grace. So he is going to try to redirect his congregation back towards that theology. And they're not really going to hear it. So he will be fired from that job. He will eventually become president of Princeton, um, but dies um, shortly after. And he's actually going to be Aaron Burr's grandfather. We'll talk more about him later. So one of the things Jonathan Edwards believes is that the Enlightenment has really made a mistake in seeking truth, right? Are our five senses actually accurate? How often have you misheard something? You said what? Oh, I thought you said something else completely, right? You think like, do I smell something burning? No, I don't. Um, How often do you feel something and be like, is that wet? Oh, no, it's just cold. It's not wet. It's just cold. Our sense is not infallible, right? Our feelings are not always accurate. I might feel really hurt by something. My feelings might be hurt, but that's sort of a me problem. It's not, nothing was wrong. Um, no one did anything wrong. I'm just feeling really sensitive today. And so a sort of innocuous comment made me feel bad, right? Jonathan Edwards is going to, um, sort of attack this, say, look, you can't rely on your own truth, right? There's no, oh, just you do you. You can do that, but you're going to go to hell for that. He's going to say sinners are just a step, just a half step away from suffering the wrath of God, right? Um, And so you need rebirth. You need to acknowledge your sins and ask for grace. Hmm. All right. I'm going to read you a excerpt from this sermon and side note, um, Jonathan Edwards is often associated by like with fire and brimstone, you're going to hell sermons, but actually most of his sermons were much more hopeful, right? His goal here is not to make people feel bad. His goal is to, um, 
have people live more faithfully, live in a way that is more in line with the Bible. But let me read to you part of his sermon. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him more infinitely, more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet it is nothing but his hands that hold you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell the last night, that you suffered to wake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. And there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose this morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God, provoking his pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner by attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as to a reason why you do not this very moment drop into hell. Right? He is saying, you could have died last night. You could have died this morning. You could die this instant. And in all of those scenarios, if you died, you would be going to hell. You have sinned against God and you are worthy of damnation. The only reason why you're not dead yet is because God is merciful and he's giving you a chance to repent. So take advantage of his mercy, right? God's keeping you alive and repent. All right. Who's the other preacher to know for the great awakening? George Whitfield. He's British and he is really going to preach the need for a new birth. He's really going to be the one to spark the great awakening. And his message is a little less fire and brimstone. God is merciful. Salvation is in your hands, right? Instead of fear of predestination and damnation, you can save yourself through repentance. He describes the joy of salvation and the horror of damnation. And in every sermon, he asked his listeners to, um, to look into their hearts and ask themselves, are you saved? He was apparently a very evocative preacher. Jonathan Edwards wept when he heard his, him preach because he was so moved. And Benjamin Franklin, who wasn't really a believer, um, passed around a penny, right? He was a deist. He believed that sure there was a God, but like he wasn't active in our life. But after a, after a sermon, um, what field would pass around a hat being like, we're accepting donations, blah, blah, blah. Like that paid for my room and board. And even Franklin was moved enough to give some money. Right. So thousands converted in the face of this question, are you saved? He is described as having the most angelic, young, slim, slender youth clothed with the authority from a great God. And his core message is this, you have a need for a new birth. This revival movement is going to be very attractive to the lower classes, right? It criticized commercial society and wealthy merchants, right? Merchants who force people into debt, rich Southerners with their gambling, horse racing, and drinking on the Sabbath, right? Robert Carter III, grandson of Robert King Carter in Virginia, was actually so moved by um, the Great Awakening that he emancipated all of his slaves. He freed all of his slaves because he, um, the Great Awakening really opened his eyes to the idea that they are his equal in Christ, right? 
we see that the great awakening is going to have a huge impact. It will start a African-American Christian tradition. It will, um, Whitfield will have many imitators, right? If you, if salvation is in your hands, you don't need a church controlled by the state, right? In Massachusetts, the general court, these congregationalist churches, um, were funded in part through taxpayer dollars in Virginia. You had the Anglican church instead you have these new preachers, right? We'll talk about this tension between the old lights and the new lights. The old lights are the upper classes, the older Puritans, ones who want to continue tradition, the ones who also tended to be wealthier. The new lights are more attracted to these new denominations, right? They tend to be lower classes. Why should my taxpayers have to go to support the Anglican church or this congregationalist church when I am going to go hear this other preacher speak in a field? I want this to, to my money to go towards that church. The Great Awakening will really unite the colonies and expand Protestantism. From its start, we will have new denominations born, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians. We start to see the expansion of religious freedom as well. So you will have no church supported by tax. And when I say church, I don't mean like St. John's over there. I, I'm talking about a denomination. And it will foster individualism and religious tolerance as well. Okay, so, oops. Let's talk a little bit about the Seven Years' War. Um, the Seven Years' War, um, there's a great crash course on it. And I definitely encourage you to watch it. But the colonies are starting to be in crisis, right? What major social and political crises rocked the colonies in the late 17th century? Well, there's going to be a few things, right? There's the Maryland uprising where a Protestant association overthrows the Baltimore governor. A new charter and Protestant government is established. So if you remember, Maryland was originally a proprietary colony, not anymore. You have the Leesler Rebellion in New York, which we've talked about already. Leesler will end up being hung and quartered. It's a violent conflict um, between the Dutch and the English. You have changes in New England with the New Dominion and Governor Andros. And then of course you have the Salem Witch Trials. The Salem Witch Trials get a lot of traction in popular media. Um, we don't know exactly what happened. Um, was it all the imagination of some teenage girls? Um, some historians attribute it to a fungus that was growing um, amongst the food and that was the experiences that they had. Really though, it was this tension between outsiders and insiders. We have a land shortage. And so you have this incident where these teenage girls are experiencing what they will attribute to be attacks from witches. They are like, oh, they'll say like, oh, I'm being pinched or I'm sick or I'm having seizures or whatever. And they'll say like, Goody Proctor is a witch and she should have a witch bite. And this panic will sweep through Massachusetts. People will be accused. People will be accusing their wives, their mothers. Um, really, it's a failure on the part of leadership to control the situation. And we see it stops finally when the governor's wife is accused and then the governor gets involved and the leadership really cracks down and it is stopped. There's a great Ted ed on the Salem witch trials. I'd encourage you to watch that. It's not something that really comes up on the AP test. So I'm not going to get into it, but this Ted ed video will give you information that you need. We see in general a just growth in colonial America, right? We have an increase in the non-English population. Many Germans are migrating over. 
Um, the Germans tend to come over as families and with money. They will settle in rural New York, Pennsylvania, and in the West. So if you ever hear about like the Pennsylvania Dutch, those are Germans who settled in Pennsylvania. They even spoke um, German in their towns. They were Lutheran primarily. We start to see an increase in religious diversity. Most colonies barred Catholics and Jews from voting or holding office. But as we have the birth of new denominations, Methodists, Baptists, then this will end up including um, Catholics and Jews as well. In Pennsylvania, we had the most religious diversity. We see social classes um, expanding, right? A development of the colonial elite who will dominate politics. You have this whole South Carolina aristocracy um, as families start to be here for multiple generations and just accumulate wealth and power. But we still have poverty in the colonies as well. Birth rates increased um, population more than immigration. And attitudes and policies towards the poor were very similar to those in the UK. So not a lot of support for the poor. The difference is that in the American colonies, you had more opportunities for advancement, right? You could move out West, you could buy land, you could just go out and squat on land that you didn't legally buy and grow your own food or learn a skill. Unlike in Europe though, the American colonies had a thriving middle class. And even women contributed to the household economy, right? American women were expected to be good wives and mothers. Um, they participated in the family business as well as cooking, cleaning, making butter, assisting on the farm, educating the children. While slavery was much more common in the South, we know that in the North, it was a very small population, only the very rich had slaves and they tended to be domestic servants. Okay, so that wraps up period two. Um, I want you to explain how and why the movement of a variety of people and ideas from across the Atlantic contributed to the development of American culture over time.